Hi there, Dave Markham here. On April 9th, 2014, three people from Brockport, PM Ketchum, Michelle Reed, and I, David Markham, gave a presentation at the PIRI, that's Partners in Restorative Initiatives Conference, at RIT. Our presentation dealt with the development of restorative justice practices in the village of Brockport, at the college, in the community, and in our personal life. Michelle Reed presented the work uh, she does with Anna Barone in residential life services at SUNY Brockport in terms of dealing with offenses that arise among the college uh, population. Pam Ketchum talked about the community service that she supervises uh, of people who have to do community service in the community that is done primarily in the various gardening projects that Pam does in the village parks and welcome center. And I presented what's happened to me in my personal life and the psychosocial uh, benefits of restorative justice. In this brief presentation, I am going to recapitulate the presentation I did at the Peary Conference at RIT. I began talking about how I stumbled into restorative justice in 1994, uh, the year following my two children, Ryan and Bridget, being killed by a three-time DWI offender. Brian and uh, Ryan and Bridget were killed on March 10th, 1993, and the offender, it was his third DWI, was driving a tractor trailer truck full of 43,000 pounds of flour when he crashed into the car driven by my wife and four children on Route 31 in the town of Ogden, just as you enter the 531 uh, entrance. A year later, uh, in a three-day trial in Ogden Town Court in front of Judge Martin Ryan, the offender was convicted and at the time given the maximum sentence of one year in jail, lost his license for a year, and he paid a $1,000 fine. I was able to give a victim impact statement prior to a year later, uh, in a three-day trial in Ogden Town Court in front of Judge Martin Ryan, the offender was convicted and at the time given the maximum sentence of one year in jail, lost his license for a year, and he paid a $1,000 fine. I was able to give a victim impact statement prior to his sentencing and having found out in the year that had taken to adjudicate his crime that he was known as the town alcoholic. And knowing that this was his third DWI, this is a man who had had a chronic, serious use, uh, misuse, abuse, addiction to alcohol, and had never had any treatment. Knowing that his sitting in the Monroe County Jail for a year, nine months probably, with good behavior and then being released into the community did nothing to solve the problem nor protect the community because once released he probably would return to drinking, get his license back, and possibly kill someone else. So I had asked for 90 days shock incarceration, a maximum period of probation, and that he be ordered for a substance abuse evaluation and if recommended uh, be expected to follow through with treatment. This was not done and a few months after his sentence I became increasingly concerned that the root cause of the problem that killed my children was not being addressed. So I called the jail naively and asked if I could visit the offender to discuss with him his problem with alcohol and was told that I could not do that unless he put me on his visitors list. I wrote him a letter. He did put me on his visitors list and I did go to uh, visit him. And he was in the uh, first group to receive drug and alcohol treatment 
in the Monroe County Jail on East Henrietta Road, a program that had been instituted by then Sheriff Andrew Maloney. Here are pictures of the truck and car uh, involved in the crash, as well as my son Brid uh, Ryan, who was eight years old at the time, and my daughter Bridget, uh, who was five. Somewhat uh, coincidentally, I gave this presentation on April 9th, and Bridget's birthday is on April 11th, and uh, I'm recording this the day after her birthday on April 12th. She would be 26 years old had she lived. She was the, uh, Ryan and Bridget were the two youngest of Angela and my nine children. When we look at the criminal justice system, we have uh, taken for granted what is called the King's Justice. It's called the King's Justice because it is an adversarial criminal justice system which uh, is framed as a contest between the state, represented by the district attorney, and the offender. It's adversarial and uh, has very little to do with the truth or justice because the uh, defendant, the offender, is innocent until proven guilty. If the person is found guilty, they're expected to be punished. So the adversarial system of criminal justice, which we have now, has often been called retributive, and uh, it's based on uh, our old biblical, Old Testament belief in vengeance, an eye for an eye, you do the crime, you do the time. Historically, victims have been marginalized. The victims, uh, up until about 30 years ago, had no part in the process whatsoever. Uh, this was between the king, i.e. the state, and the offender and the offender's defense counsel. Offenders, if they were found guilty, often were stigmatized for life as ex-cons, felons, and became second-class citizens, often forced into a career as a criminal because they are, were not restored to community uh, participation in life. Uh, the recidivism rate uh, in our current criminal justice system is approximately 65%. So our criminal justice system does not serve us very well. It costs $45,000 to keep a person incarcerated in New York State. Two-thirds of that uh, group, once they're released into the community, will reoffend and uh, go back to prison. So by just about any social science research indicator, criminal justice system is extremely expensive and uh, also extremely ineffective. The recognition of this fact that as a society we cannot go on just incarcerating people because it doesn't serve victims, nor the community, nor the offenders very well. And so over the last 30 or 40 years, there has been a whole new paradigm which has grown increasingly popular, which is called restorative justice. And the basic idea of in restorative justice is that there is a negotiation between the victim and the offender of what the harm was that was actually done. Uh, once there's agreement reached on the nature and extent of the harm, then there is also a, a discussion about what it would take to repair the harm. And once there's agreement about what it would take to make amends and to repair the harm, then an agreement is struck, uh, struck which the offender then has agreed to participate in and complete in order to restore the victim as best as possible to their full well-being. And also, the offender is restored to community uh, membership. Historically, in uh, tribes where an offender could not be sent off to prison or shunned from the tribe, but had to continue to live uh, with the group of which the offender was a member of, uh, restorative justice was used to uh, make the victim whole again, and then the offending deviant behavior of the 
uh, perpetrator would be dealt with in such a way that the perpetrator was uh, restored to community participation in life. Uh, that rarely happens uh, these days uh, as already has been described. Here in Brockport, uh, with the planning for the village court, there has been a growing interest in seeing a restorative component implemented as part of the village court process. And uh, a few people are working on a proposal of how that might be done. Already, restorative practices are being used at the college, uh, which Michelle Reed and Anna Barone will describe uh, in a further presentation and community service as a way of repairing the harm uh, supervision is being provided by PM Ketchum in the gardening programs in Rochester uh, or in Brockport. Also some of the police officers of the Brockport Police Department uh, make efforts to have the uh, offender deal with the victim to compensate the victim for whatever harm has been done to the victim. In my case, uh, a Brockport police officer found uh, a group of college students who had committed some vandalism on my property in Brockport. They had uh, tore down some hanging plants and ripped up uh, flowers in my garden and the uh, perpetrator agreed to reimburse me $75 for uh, replacement plants, which I then did not press charges uh, since I had been compensated for the damage that was done. In this case, the perpetrator never went to court, was not arrested, but a uh, civil agreement was reached between the perpetrator and myself brokered by the Brockport police officer. There also is some discussion of restorative practices being used at Brockport Central School and PERI, Partners in Restorative Initiatives, provide training to school districts to help resolve uh, student conflicts and other kinds of uh, offenses uh, in schools so that they do not wind up in a uh, criminal court proceeding. These are in very uh, early stages of discussion uh, but may further develop. Obviously restorative justice approach to uh, the killing of my children does not bring them back to life. However, incarcerating the offender for a year, fining him $1,000 and taking away his license uh, does nothing to protect the community from further um, <clears throat> harm, nor does it help the offender in any way, nor was it an acceptable solution to me and my family for the harm that had been done uh, to us. Uh, sometimes people ask me uh, how I was able to engage in a restorative justice approach before I even knew what it was and it was simply <clears throat> my heartfelt sense that justice was not served uh, it was alcohol that had killed my children and until the root problem was addressed uh, justice had not been served. Uh, very often restorative justice approaches uh, negotiated between the offender and the uh, victim and community support people get to the uh, bottom of the nature of the harm and injustice that's been done and hopefully uh, then the situation can be adequately addressed and there is some sort of restoration of a sense of equity and mutuality uh, in the relationships between the offender and society. Uh, some of the preliminary evidence is that recidivism is reduced and victims and uh, the community are much more satisfied with a restorative justice process than with the uh, traditional adversarial process. 
That's it for this presentation. I appreciate your listening. If you have questions, feel free to uh, send me an email, davidgmarkham at gmail.com, or you can call me at 585-727-3663. As a community, we continue to work on the development of restorative justice practices here in the Brockport area. Thank you so much. Have a good day.